the Round Table at Uncle Studios in beautiful Southern California. Welcome to another edition of WorkCom Matters, the central location for all your workers' compensation, employment, and labor law matters, and you employ, employer, and independent contractors. My name is Steve Appel, and I'll be your host for the next hour with some talk, news, and hopefully some answers about WorkCom Matters. Thanks for being part of the show, and if you can break away from your WorkCom Matters, feel free to give us a call and clue us in. Phone number worldwide, 818-357-4120. You can send an email to wcexaminer at aol.com. You can be old school, send a fax, 818-475-1437. With me in studio, my right-hand man, Mike Zima, attorney John Scalia, attorney Robert Ozeron, Scott Walton of Uncle Studio is on the board, working out all the technical difficulties. Back at work on Central making sure the whole damn thing goes right, is Jake Paris. As the music slowly fades out, oh, we got to love it. And uh, this is really a special edition uh, because uh, according to Siri, as the crow flies from 5,800 miles away, John Scalia is in studio. Welcome, John. How was everything and how was your flight in? Thanks. My flight in was interesting. I had the worst seatmate I've ever had on a transatlantic flight. This woman had her luggage in my in my seat, had her seat in my seat, and then she spent half the flight on all fours, literally with her feet on the chair. I mean, I, I was tempted to ask her, you know, is your regular house in a tree? But I figured since she was a person of color, that probably would have been offensive. Now, so I did not ask that. Um, you know, I, I don't fly that much any anymore. But when I do occasionally, uh, I've noticed, and it's probably me getting older and a little heavier, that that tray top table is sticking a little more into my gut than it used to in my younger years. Now, you you run a marathon once or twice a, uh, year. a year yeah, yeah. and you, you're still looking in damn good shape i'm assuming that tray table is not coming in contact with you right <laughs> no and the saving grace for this woman was she was very thin but you know okay but, was, but really i mean I, I once had a flight with an iranian babushka which was more pleasant now that really must have been torture and of course which, the iranian a, babushka or this one i don't know but um, of course, based on uh, the current news that's going on, and we'll get to that uh, in a moment, uh, we did decide uh, to call the show uh, Torture. Um, your, uh, we are brought to you by A1 Law Santa Monica Tickets and ABC Rugs. If you want the number one computer management system used by more workers' compensation attorneys than any other system on the planet, you give me a call at 818-357-4120 for your no-strings-attached money-back guaranteed $1 a day A1 Law. And if you want those hard-to-get, sold-out, even front-row concert sports theater tickets, give our buddy Brian a call at Santa Monica Tickets, 310-395-8587. And now, without further ado, here's a little something from our friends at A. ABC Rugs. ABC Rugs has been in the business of manufacturing and direct importation and exportation of Persian and Oriental rugs for more than 39 years. ABC Rugs is a direct importer and wholesaler of antique, Moroccan, Oriental, and Persian rugs. Established in 1978, ABC Rugs is definitely old school. 323-897-5444. That's ABC Rugs. 323-897-5444. And um, those are our sponsors of the show. And, of course, uh, the number one news uh, tonight, and Mike's going to get into that a little later, is uh, the torturing and the death uh, of Jamal Khashoggi. Alleged. Alleged, yeah. It's also alleged that they cut him up and uh, sent in a cleaning crew afterwards. We also, speaking of deaths, uh, the uh, Paul Allen died a couple of days ago, co-founder of Microsoft, uh, owner of the Seattle, uh, I think, Supersonics, owner of the Portland Trailblazers. Seattle Seahawks and Seattle Portland Se- Trailblazers. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, we also have uh, updated news on the Aliso Canyon. Uh, I believe uh, the a group of firefighters have filed a lawsuit uh, against the canyon for uh, 
We, we got being, some cumulative being, injury claims yeah, coming being out. Being exposed to uh, uh, chemicals. Uh, Facebook has once again been uh, charged with misrepresenting uh, how many people uh, they actually have access to and or members. And now they're charged with fraud. And now they are charged with fraud. There's updated news in California workers' compensation. And we have uh, more news uh, on uh, drugs and impaired uh, driving. But uh, I got to talk to John before we get to the story. Uh, what's the current news on what's happening in Turkey uh, with uh, the situation with Shoshogi? Khashoggi, I know I'm pronouncing it wrong. Well, my, mainly I watch BBC. I probably should watch more Al Jazeera on that one. But but basically they, they assume he was killed. And the rumor is that there were two planes that flew in that same day from Saudi Arabia, flew into Istanbul and flew out that night, a very short charter. And it was apparently a hit squad of about 15 guys. I don't know if you know why he went into the embassy. He's marrying a Turkish woman, and he needed documents to prove, I think, that he was divorced from his first wife. So he walked in the embassy the first time, and they were all very nice to him, and they said, oh, gee, you know, we don't have, we don't have that paperwork with us. Can you come back in three days? So he was unsuspecting, and so he walked in three days later, and nobody ever saw him again. And he is a reporter on behalf of the Washington Post who is a Saudi Arabia citizen who went into the Saudi Arabia consulate in Turkey. Yeah, which is which is Saudi Arabian territory. As everybody knows, the, the yeah. embassy is the territory of the it's country. It's their soil. Right, yeah. right. And... He writes, yeah, he, he was a dissident. He relocated to America. As far as I know, he's only a Saudi Arabian citizen, not an American citizen. However, he was educated he, he, at Indiana State, but I don't think he is an American citizen. Yeah, I think you're yeah, correct on that. I think he had a green card, though, right? I believe. I don't, I don't know. I, I yeah, know I he was he a regular a columnist at the Washington Post. Yeah. And the real problem is that all the evidence points to the fact that he was probably murdered and maybe dismembered and then flown, flown out. And, of course, the problem is that the United States has a huge defense sales contract with Saudi Arabia. So it impacts... That plus Saudi Arabia is an ally of the United States. So well, there's when you many say- layers of it. Excuse me. I mean, because Turkey is an ally too. Yes. Uh, and Saudi Arabia hates Iran. Um, so there's many layers of it. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. So I was just gonna, you don't think he was being tortured and then accidentally killed. You think he was purposely <laughs> murdered. I, I'm asking. I don't know. I yeah. I think he was probably purposely murdered. I find it hard to believe that that he was accidentally tortured to death that seems to strain credulity but the whole world seems to be in the strain credulity phase these days depending from everybody okay i'm gonna admit ignorance what is credulity i mean is that like cruel or no it's like straining belief it, Credib- oh, okay. credibility okay okay okay. Yeah. okay okay but john why was Khashoggi in istanbul in the first place i mean why didn't he go to the saudi embassy in dc and get the papers because I because his his future wife or well was going to be his future wife is Turkish and I think that's I see. why yeah. I see yeah she lives there and he had no reason apparently to suspect that they would that they would do this I don't think well, anybody sure had that, any otherwise reason. he wouldn't have walked in of yeah. course yeah what was the motive uh, exactly for this well. I, I should probably get into my brief piece here. To All right. Lay, well, lay let, let's have Mike do the news story. We'll lay a foundation. Uh, he's my right-hand man. He is also, most recently, the chief of staff. He keeps me in trouble, out of, pardon me, out of trouble <laughs> and in check about 90% of the time. With that the was first, Freudian. Thank you. For, yes, it sure was. And I do know what that means. With the first news story of the night, Dr. Michael Zima. Thank you, Steve. Jamal Khashoggi. The Saudi Arabian journalist working for the Washington Post was seen entering the Saudi Arabian consulate in Istanbul, Turkey on October 2nd, 2018, but was not seen exiting the consulate. Many believe Khashoggi was killed inside the building, possibly dismembered, and then taken out in two large black vehicles. Some believe Khashoggi was tortured and then killed. If so, many believe this must have been ordered by Saudi Arabia's crown prince, Mohammed, Mohammed bin Salam, or MBS, as he is known for short, in short, for short. MBS is a son of King Salman, who was reported to be suffering from Alzheimer's disease. 
MBS has emerged as the de facto ruler of Saudi Arabia. MBS has been credited for a series of reforms, such as allowing women to drive automobiles. What a concept, guys. Uh, But he has also been cited for purging political rivals, imprisoning women's rights activists, and increasing the number of executions. Khashoggi had been critical of MBS. Now, John, I'm wondering what type of ink is this getting over there in Europe? Although I, I... uh, you're getting most of your news from the BBC, um, but Khashoggi was an interesting guy. I mean, for example, he knew Osama bin Laden. He tried to supposedly he tried to get Osama bin Laden to give up violence. Well, we know how well that turned out. <laughs> um, but uh, Khashoggi really thinks that MBS is a bad guy, mm-hmm. and initially when. You know, it came out that, oh, women can now drive automobiles. Oh, the guy must be so progressive and blah, 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 blah. But that's not really his, that's not really the, apparently the type of guy he is. So over there in Europe, I mean, do they have a read on this MBS guy? I think the short answer is no. Really? Yeah. I think, I think they portray him in the beginning. They certainly portrayed him as a reformer. So most, most of the press viewed him as a guy who was going to modernize Saudi society. And I think this whole thing with Khashoggi has obviously placed that an issue, and people are wondering, well, maybe Khashoggi had a point. Maybe the guy's not a real reformer. I mean, let's face it. you know, Saudi Arabia is still under Sharia law. Yeah. And certainly uh, Salman, you know, whatever fish he is, uh, had no intention of getting rid of Sharia law. So how much of a reform can you have in a society where – it's official policy that women are going to be repressed, you know. Right. And now you have various members of the Senate, even the Republicans. Well, all of the Democrats are speaking out, but you have multiple Republicans, including Lindsey Mike's Graham. favorite, Lindsey Graham, speaking out and and essentially just uh, speaking out negatively about this. But Donald Trump, of course, uh, is not speaking out super negatively. He, he wants to keep the political relations going. He wants to keep the business going. And uh, how do you think this is going to uh, affect Trump and his well, uh, political base? I think Trump is all about money. And so he could care less if they murder a dissident. And I don't think he cares about murdering anybody. He, you know, he loves Duterte. Duterte's murdered plenty of people in the Philippines. Well, he said he, loves, he, he said he could go out at the corner of 42nd Street and he could shoot someone and, and his, his base wouldn't care, right? Probably not. But, but well, maybe that might be a line too far even yeah, in America. Maybe it was a little tongue in cheek. That was hyperbole, a, I think. Yeah, you know. Maybe. Anyway, <laughs> perhaps. But, yeah, I mean, obviously he's, he's friends with Putin. I mean, Putin dispatches uh, GRU guys to assassinate people in Britain, and Trump doesn't say anything about that. He's friends with uh, the Saudis. He's friends with Duterte. He loves dictators, let's face it. Uh, he wants to be one. Well, I think, I think <laughs> he loves leaders of foreign nations because he can open up the channels, like you said, of business with them, mm-hmm. an untapped source of business. I agree. I think he's all about money. I think I think money's his god, and the only thing that matters to him is money. And he could care less about human rights. I'm not sure he can read any documents about human rights, but you know he, he doesn't. Why do you say that? Do you think that's funny when I you think, say something like that? Do you think it's funny? Uh, no, I think it's accurate. So you you don't think he can read? Not much. <laughs> well, I prob- I maybe, think maybe I, a bit more hyperbole, I, like like has already been said. I think earlier. he's basically obviously a, people can take that oh, for themselves. I think he's basically a functional illiterate. Yeah, I don't think he, I don't think he, I seriously don't think he can actually read, really read and understand. There's no indication of it. <clears throat> Have you ever heard the guy say anything that was philosophically deep or deep about human rights or deep about any of our founding documents, the Declaration of Independence or the Bill of Rights? The last thing he said about the Bill of Rights was, "Well, we should tighten up the libel laws." I think what he meant by that is, you know, I want to take the New York Times editors and put them in jail. Well, if we're being if we're being serious and appears you are, I have yeah. seen him read word for word from speeches. <laughs> um, I other also, people write. <laughs> well, well, that, that Obama was really good at that. That further justifies my point is that he didn't memorize it. He's reading it because someone else wrote it. Obviously, and I, obviously, obviously, he can read sentences. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about reading with comprehension. I don't think he can read any complicated 
complicated idea and comprehension. The story is when Paul Junker came here to talk, John Paul Claude Junker came here to talk to him about Travis and the European Union. He had been briefed that Trump is an idiot. Okay, Junker and, and is who? Just lay the foundation. He's the president of the European Union. Oh, okay, okay. I okay. didn't know who that was either, and, Mike. And Please when he, continue. When he, when he came here to negotiate, we're all going to get briefed for being idiots. <laughs> you know what I mean? So when he came here, when he he was told that Trump was an idiot, and and so what he did is when he talked to Trump to try to get him, and he succeeded in getting him to backpedal on the tariffs. Uh, the rumor is that five by seven cards where he had very simple concepts and he had five by seven cards that he would flip and explain complicated concepts to Mr. Moron with his five by seven cards, you know, and it worked. I understand, I understand that it was tariff. Junket that, uh, that flipped. Am I wrong on that? I mean, maybe I'm an idiot who can't understand a concept. No, in the end, it was Junket that Yeah, tripped. in the end, the because actual of, negotiations because, went Trump's way. Yeah. Because of so, the tariffs. Yeah. Well, so, so who's the idiot? Well, for, well for, obviously, results speak for themselves. But going into it, obviously, well, you could also talk a lot of smack. Results, uh, results don't speak for themselves because America is clearly the largest, you know, America is clearly the largest and most powerful economy in the world. So obviously, when you deal from a, from a position of power, uh, and and if you don't care about anything else, you're obviously going to. But don't you look? It looks, it looks a little bad to call somebody an idiot going in and then lose. Doesn't that look bad all around? I, I didn't say Junker called him an idiot. I said well, he was getting briefed, br- briefed on the fact that Trump was incapable of understanding. If either side is getting concepts. some information that's so like negative and defamatory about the other, and then they end up losing. Uh, there's probably because they set themselves up for failure by underestimating That's the why you side. never, uh, ever, yeah. ever underestimate like, your opponent. It's like Trump's book, The Art of the Deal, you know? So, uh, I don't know. I've actually never read Rob, that book. I was going to say, I never <laughs> no, read it either. A joke, but I think but that's I, in there. I do know this, that, that when r- Trump was running for presidential office, there was uh, an analysis done that the average uh, uh words, concepts, phrases in his speeches were about a fourth grade reading level. But then again, that might be a majority of his yeah, base. That might be on purpose, too. They tell you, for example, as a lawyer, when you're going to be talking to a jury, you're supposed to pick high school. I don't know about fourth grade, <laughs> right? That's a bit much, right? Well, That's like coloring. Well, I think so. No, no, I, I read the but, same. Yeah, I read the but same you're supposed Steve's to pick high about. school. Well, yeah. the yes. average newspaper is not even at a high school reading level. It's at a... It's at a, 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 a a middle school reading level, yeah. like eighth grade at best, the well, average a, newspaper. A jury is 12 people, so they say high school is how you're supposed to talk to them. That type 12 of comfort- people who don't have the smarts to get out of jury duty. Please well, continue. <laughs> okay. But I could only assume that if you're going to talk to a larger group, perhaps that you would actually decrease the the level at which you talk to them. So a smaller group you can talk, right? One-on-one you can talk high-minded graduate level things. Right, and a twelve pack of like a jury, it's probably more high school level. And if you're talking to millions and millions of people, it depends on who you're talking to. If you're talking to the whole world, you can imagine how ignorant some people can be, all right, across the whole world. Uh, but if you're talking about the U.S., maybe eighth grade, maybe like high school, still but low high know, school I, freshman. I gotta say, I agree with John. I don't think I've ever heard Trump say anything that was remarkably deep. Have you, Steve? Well, I'm trying to think of anything remarkably deep that any politician says. Well, that's I, I, think, I think going into the Korean uh, summit, he said something like, uh, uh, any idiot can make war, but it takes a true, a brave man to make peace or something. It was pretty deep, actually. It was a meme going around. I saw sounds it like a internet. Hallmark card to me. Yeah, it sounded like one. It sounds biblical to me. It was. It was very deep. <laughs> but, that's another other peace But again, know you know, Bible that was on the internet. Reading, you know, the Old Testament's nothing but a war ditty. <laughs> My name is Steve Appel. You're listening to Work Up Matters. We're brought to you by A1 Law, Santa Monica Tickets, and, of course, ABC Rugs. I wanted to uh, say something about a gentleman that I have always uh, respected. Uh, Mr. Paul Allen, the co-founder of Microsoft, passed away Monday from complications from non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, uh, which had reoccurred recently after having been in remission for a number of years. You know, even though he was worth over $20 billion, and even though uh, he gave away, continue, will give away a lot of his money to charity, uh, he, of course, was with Bill Gates, the founder of Microsoft, and possibly without him, Microsoft would have never been uh, developed uh, where 
Alan was more of the hands-on guy building the board. Gates was more uh, putting the thing uh, together, getting the Apparently contacts together. they were together. yin and yang, and they did have their arguments, but it resulted Which is why in creativity. It, it was, you know, just like me and you. I mean, come on, you know. <laughs> we do go at it. <laughs> yeah, yes, we do. <laughs> That's why we make such a great partnership, because we fill gaps. You know what I mean? Yes. yes. Um, I can't say enough uh, about... Paul Allen, although although I think it was Bill Gates who uh, uh, stole uh, the uh, phrase from what Leonardo da Vinci uh, when uh, talking about how Microsoft developed because Gates and I think Allen, but I'm not sure, they worked at Apple Computing for a bit and they essentially stole the Windows idea from Apple. And, I heard that a uh, long it's, time it's ago. It's true, and there are shows on this. And Bill Gates came out and said or he repeated uh, what Leonardo da Vinci said, and that is good artists copy, great artists steal. Well, well Bill, Ga- Bill Gates stole the Windows idea from Apple, made a couple of uh, adjustments so it would not be copyright infringement, and, of course, you had Microsoft, because at that time, IBM uh, refused to sell their hardware or to share their hardware and Bill Gates said you know what I don't care about the hardware I want the damn software to make the computers run I believe in turn it ended up that Bill Gates funded Steve Jobs when Apple needed money and they were about to go bankrupt. Now, that I didn't know. I thought he more Much so later. controlled him and psyched him out, and I, I oh, was not the, aware of that. In the early years, yeah. If you've seen the movie Jobs, I think it was Michael Fassbender who played Steve Jobs, right? I, I've seen both Steve Jobs movies because there was the other one with uh, who was the guy who ended up replaced Charlie Sheen in Three and a Half Men. So my question is, do yes. you not recall the plot of the movie you watched there, boss? Come I, on. I, I guess I don't <laughs> recall the plot. Why don't you tell me? <laughs> okay, well, if you recall, remember? So what you're saying is true, and then... Then later, when uh, Steve, um, Steve Jobs left Apple and then came back, I believe there was a cash shortage, and they were talking about closing up and going bankrupt, and then he turned to Bill Gates, of all people, for the influx of cash, and he was the one who loaned him all that money to keep Apple up. I'm still wondering, I'm not sure if Apple, if Microsoft still has a large percentage of Apple stock. I don't know if that's actually how it works, or if there was just a loan and it was paid back. I, you know, obviously the movie didn't cover the financials, you know, I don't know how that works. But, yeah, that was kind of a big part of the movie, Boz. Well, you said on this show (laughs) that Amazon was going to be the first trillion-dollar company, which it was. No, Apple is the first trillion-dollar company. Oh, and Amazon was second? Correct. But now it's actually back down. It's right around the level. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. As you get older, you'll realize why we forget the plot. (laughs) (laughs) I was just wondering. You know, I wasn't sure. I was just... (laughs) Because because you acted surprised, you know. Okay. Well, I I, I see a lot of movies, too. It's true. We we all consume a lot of media nowadays. I was going to say i need to see a movie about three to five times before i can remember everything in the plot you know well my son over there sitting sitting on the sitting on the couch used, john, to, used john to tell me brought his audience again go used, ahead used to tell me that dad you know you could all you need to do is rent one dvd and watch it every day because the next day you won't remember what it was anyway oh my god well we're all we're all gonna have that destiny it looks like so it's it's fine Plus, it keeps things fresh, right? Well, I've got that to look forward to. Thank you, John. <laughs> yeah, thank, no thank you for that. And John, since you're here in studio, why don't you pick a new story and go ahead and read it and see if it generates five minutes of conversation. Okay. Facebook Incorporated knew in early 2015 that it misled advertisers about the average time users spent viewing online video clips and then lied about it, according to a lawsuit. The owner of the world's largest social network acknowledged in September 2016 that it had inflated the metric for marketers and said it fixed its calculations. CrowdSiren, the online marketing agency that sued over the misrepresentations, now claims that Facebook knew as early as 2015 that it was over-reporting the figures. CrowdSiren recently amended their complaint to include fraud. You know, I got to mention the Facebook thing because Jared, the IT guy, is in back of me. And Jared was hounding me for like a year or whatever to do a video thing. And of course, I, you know, I, I, I resist having this show as video for a variety of reasons, mainly the cost. Because we're all ugly or what? No, it, it's mainly the cost. <laughs> that is mainly his joke. The cost. <laughs> but, you know, we, we, we get, you know, an average of 30, 40, 50 hits a show within the first couple of weeks. 
And then we did the video thing. We put it together. We edited it. And within the first week, we got like 800 hits. And so now, Jared, the IT guy, that we just did that, and we're probably up above 1,000 hits on you know, the making of War Comp Matters. It's there. Uh, you think that's fraud? <laughs> well, um, Come on closer to the mic, Jared, the IT guy. You can take Jared, the IT guy. Jared, the IT guy. Yeah, there is definitely misleading information there when you're an advertiser. Um, advertisers um, um, are looking at the numbers and they're going, wow, um, somebody's viewed my video a hundred times. Well, in reality, it's a little video ad that's kind of plain while you're reading something else you're reading about your niece or nephew or whatever and the video is playing over on the in the column which, and that's, which and may that's, not even be on your screen at the time it could or, possibly be yeah. well when it scrolls down it does stop so yeah. it, you know the minutes that someone watched a video isn't really it's it's very misleading because it, it's not you're not always watching what's going on in the left right column you're you you're reading the main thread which is, uh, you know, your niece or nephew's baseball game or whatever. Actually, it's more misleading that the number of views they're reporting is not really what people are watching. They're, they're, it's just on the screen at the time that they're reading something else, most likely. So yeah. why, why have they alleged fraud? That's what I want what, 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 to... Because exactly they're saying the they're, they're alleging that uh, the Facebook, Facebook folks... inflated the numbers. Th they knew... That they were yeah, cooking the books. They knew it. Fraud would inquire. And they intentionally uh, misrepresented a material fact, but what is basically. Okay. Additionally, they knew yeah. that millions of Facebook accounts were owned by bots or and, whatever, not, not real people. And additionally, it's an allegation. You can allege whatever you'd like. Well, there's also uh, the point that when um, a video plays, it plays automatically as you scroll up. Um, you didn't click play. So the advertisers are thinking... Somebody click play on my video, you know, a hundred times or a so thousand times. It's misleading to people who think they're being more viewed than they are. Right. Now, you know, I still continue to think, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, that uh, Mark Zuckerberg is uh, not the lily white wonderful guy that uh, you guys think he is. Well, this is a pretty specific lawsuit as it's a, a, a very specific issue. Right, because do you guys market on Facebook? Does anyone here have any experience kind of marketing? I, I have some experience, but I don't currently do it. I know that you do it on a regular basis. So you and I both have some experience Absolutely, with this. Absolutely, I do. All right, and it tells you kind of your reach, right, when you do yes. the, the marketing. So I'd be more interested if that was fake, like your reach, as they say. That's how many people viewed your ad. Um because a lot of these things, they do feel misleading, but I guess it's just really what's in the fine print. I'm not sure what I don't we're agreeing to. I don't understand the reach. Can you uh, define that a little bit? A reach is the number of people who have seen your ad. I mean, seen, seen, or just flipped there just for a while it. while you were looking at Correct. your cousin's baseball game? Correct. You could have scrolled past it. So my question is, is there a differentiation in Facebook as to when you click on an ad or as, when you, as to when you yes. simply scroll? That there is a metric. They, they give you that differentiation. Okay. But what technically is involved in that reach could, is so open to interpretation. Sometimes I wonder it too. Uh, what, what does that involve necessarily? Uh, how quick? But if it comes up on your screen, and I guess if you're scrolling past it, right, that's different than if you get a click. Clicks are harder. So you have a certain number of views, and then you have a certain number of clicks, and then you'll know how many clicks per view, and that's usually your average right there. Uh, so you have to make sure that you're – like, you know, then you can talk about profitability and how much the ads cost versus the average retention and all of that. Uh, so uh, – but there is that vagueness about reach, and these video ads look like they're more specific as to video only, but they're also vague and possibly misleading – and if they lie about how, you know, if they knew if it was misleading, I guess that's the fraud allegation. That but is the fraud allegation. That's, that's, a, that's a reach, I'd are, say. Are the rates based on that? Yes. So you can pay based on the uh, amount that your reach will increase to other users. So they'll show you. Uh, and you can set a budget. That's what's so easy about these online marketers. That's why I think long term it's still a good business, the online advertising, because Google and Facebook are the only businesses for this pretty much, right? I guess there's Bing. Well, or there's something. Bing, yeah. Yeah, the, the Bing. The thin, no one uses Bing right now but okay. well actually when you buy a, a new computer the bing is what's automatically defaulted onto the search and then you have to switch it up to get google as your home page right what computers are you buying 
Uh, <laughs> okay. Anyway, because I'm just saying, I bought a different computer. I guess. Okay. Uh, okay. I'm buying a MacBook. Well, oh, we, oh, oh, yeah. Well, I'm I'm buying PCs. Okay. So. If I'm not mistaken, a majority, if not all, of your PCs right now have Bing as the default search, and then you have to switch it if you want to do Google, Google Chrome, or something like that. And that's interesting because the Google is just like so massive, right? So people actively choose to switch their search engine. Uh, and download a new browser and then go from there, right? Google Chrome, probably. That's right. Google Chrome does not come uh, pre-installed uh, on any of the computers. That, that's my understanding. Yeah, mine too. I, I get the feeling that uh, the Facebook uh, crew and uh, the Zuckerberg crew has some exposure here for the fraud allegations. What, what, uh, yeah, that's what I was going to ask. So, so the rates are based on what they tell you is the reach, right? That, yeah, that's what the rates so are. So the allegation is they're lying about the reach so they can inflate the rates. Oh, yeah. The other thing, it's always I mean, about attracting more customers. It's all about the money. Yeah, right, but that's the allegation, right? Basically, yes. Okay. That, they're, that they're lying about what your money can buy. Okay. Right, and you can buy this much, but in reality, you're not buying that much. You still so, think that's a reach? For the plaintiff suit? <laughs> well, it depends what the facts are. I don't know. I got. I didn't know that was the suit. I, I wasn't aware that the suit was where they were advertising how much you could reach. The suit was based on how much they reported you did reach. Here, this suit is based on video and the length of time that uh, a prospective uh, advertis- uh, advertisee, I don't know. Advertiser. Av- no, because you're the person who's receiving the advertiser, <clears throat> consumer would be, potential consumer, okay. uh, spent looking at that video. Right. Because my, that's my, what's vague, because maybe they weren't even looking point, at it directly. But that's my point exactly. F- uh, the suit is not against Facebook for telling people, okay, if you advertise, you will reach this many people. It's after your advertising is completed, Facebook gave you your advertising report. Report card, you, yeah. Yes, which said you did reach this many people. Correct, and then and, and that's and misleading. And then you did not. Yes, that's my understanding. So you're yes. assuming that you've reached these people, that they've watched your videos, Facebook, so you're more likely Facebook to pay more money in the future. Facebook has reported to you that you have reached this many people, and the suit says you have not. Yeah, okay, but that's even exactly what we have to look into. Even if they've lied about it, how is that distinguished from puffery? Right. That's the problem. Exactly. That's why we have to look at the facts on something like this to see exactly what type of uh, detailed reports were coming back to the consumer or the person doing the advertisement uh, and purchasing it from the consumer of uh, Facebook's advertisement and then see what was said there. If Facebook is telling you that it's direct and it's this and it's that or you have emails from a marketing rep, anything of those nature, you know, that's going to be explicit. That's going to be a violation. And but just, if it's just, just puffery, then yeah, John's right. Just, we should explain what puffery is for uh, our listeners who don't necessarily. Well, it's what uh, it's what Trump does, right? <laughs> I mean, let's be honest here. That's we all know what puffery is. Hyperbole. It's hyperbole. It's the greatest, right? I mean, but, it's the but, best. But you learn in the, like your first day of law school that puffery is not illegal. That generally and, no, and especially you, for business. That's and correct. They, and they use the example of world's, car salesman. World's usually, best coffee. Usually, Am I right? Yeah, yeah right. There you go. The world's best now, coffee. Now I want to ask Jared, the IT guy, but let's not mess with Mike's microphone. Just, just not. When we did the making of work comp matters, and we got those not 800, 900 hits in the first week. We did not pay for advertising for that, right? That was all organic per se. Is that correct? Yes, those were organic uh, views, whether they yeah. were clicked on or not. Right. But I, I, I strongly believe that they should their metrics should be based on who clicked and who was actually interested. Yeah, but, you know, we, we do the show here uh, on the average. We get about 50 hits in the week, maybe closer to 30. We do the one... And and these shows are an hour. Steve, what does the word organic mean in that context? It it means that it's natural without advertising. If I put something on my Facebook, what which it was put on my Facebook, I'm not. I don't even think I shared it or not. It's without extracurricular advertising. I just put it on my Facebook and let it fly. Um, and like I was saying, we do these shows and they are audio only. We get about 30 to 50 hits in the first week. Lately, it's been closer to 30, which tells us about the, the content and, and whatnot. But we we did the uh, making of War Comp Matters, which was a three minute video. And we put it on the show, and within a week, according to Facebook, we got about 850 or 900 hits, 100% organic, i.e. we did not pay a single dollar in advertising for it. Well, somebody must be listening to us. I thought it was just you clicking refresh at night. <laughs> That's what I was. I would have sworn, but I talk to people, and some people do actually listen. Yeah, I, I, cl- say hi I click there. refresh, but it's not on my Facebook, trust me. <laughs> 
My name is Steve Appel. You're listening to Work Comp Matters. We're brought to you by A1 Law, Santa Monica Tickets, and, of course, ABC Rugs. Uh, we'll be back with more talk, more news, hopefully some answers for you employees, you employers, and independent contractors. But right now it's time for a musical break from the Cherry Blue Storms and Baby, You're a Rich Man. How does it feel to be one of the beautiful people? Now that you know who you are, what do you want to be? And have you traveled very far, far as the eye can see? Baby, you're a rich man. Baby, you're a rich man too. You keep all your money in a good brown bag inside a zoo. What a thing to do. How does it feel to be one of the beautiful people? How often have you been there? Often enough to know. What did you see when you were there? Nothing that doesn't show. Baby, you're a rich man. Lachlan and baby, you're a rich man. My name is Steve Appel. You're listening to Work Comm Matters. We're brought to you by A1 Law, Santa Monica Tickets, and of course, our friends at ABC Rugs. We have John Scalia traveled about 6,000 miles to be in studio, and it's a pleasure to have him here as always. And um, I think we wanted to get back to the topic of the show. Uh, which is uh, torture, Donald oh. Trump. Yeah, I was talk to about talk John's to first marriage. Here. Whatever. Well, <laughs> we don't want to go that that deep into torture, <laughs> right? If you really want to go deep, you talk about We're, my marriage. We want to go ahead. I'm just saying we want to abide by the Geneva Convention here. Fine, so, go for it. Go for okay. it. Okay, so uh, I wanted to ask the panel here uh, what you guys thought about the fact that Trump did not freeze the arms sales to Saudi Arabia, even though potentially he could have at least put a, a temporary pause on it. He didn't want to interrupt the business dealings of Boeing and all the defense contractors. And it would also, and and it's it's one that Mike and I talked about this today. We normally uh, try and keep the information in the show about California news. And I, my, we, Mike and I were talking, how is this California news related? And the companies that you just mentioned, they obviously have employees here in California. Well, a lot of them do, yeah. yeah. Uh, a lot of the aircraft manufacturer and the parts there, for sure. Uh, so these are big orders uh, as far as the military is concerned. And I know that the Russians wanted the order from the Saudis. The Chinese wanted that's the order. That's what Rubio was talking about. Yeah. But I heard, and people were saying, well, that's why we couldn't freeze the, the, uh, the sale, at least temporarily, because we had other bidders out there. But then I heard another thing on the radio driving here, which was that the Saudis are already reliant upon American equipment, and they're in the middle of a hot war right now with those Houthis and Iran and, and all Yemen. those proxies. Yeah, so they have no time right now to switch, uh, you know, programs. 
right? They're running on American equipment and they're reliant on us. So maybe Trump did have a bit more leverage than he initially thought. And he may have been a bit uh, hasty in saying, well, I don't want to interrupt business relations based on one thing. Plus, we don't even know if it goes all the way up to the top, right? Not yet. Well, it has to. It has, has to, to, but we're not sure time. yet, right? Yeah, I think you can assume it's pretty much, pretty much. Just because it's how it's run out there. It's race ipsa loquitur. I mean, it's you know, it's a dictatorship. And do we know much about the summer. structure of the Saudis? Because actually, we 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 do know a fair amount. Uh, it is, as I understand it, a somewhat typical dictatorship. If uh, if one can say that, uh, we have a strong man who is the fair haired boy who had siblings who are not in his position right now. So the conventional wisdom has been so far that an operation of this size and this complexity had to have the backing of the top guy, supposedly. Don't you think it's a bit sloppy, though? It's remarkably sloppy. Which, I mean... Well, I the think, fact that he goes you know, into their building and he doesn't walk you, out, you that's know, so guilty. You, well, <laughs> you know, I think, actually, what could have happened is that they started roughing the guy up and oopsies, I slashed his jugular or something like that. I heard that I've also heard on the radio. Like yeah, I heard they were going to blame a two-star general now for exactly what you're saying, torture that got out of hand in a rough interrogation. But then I also heard that they had some sort of uh, autopsy doctor there at the site, <laughs> waiting, ready to go. So that, that also raises a lot of concerns of why that gentleman would be there at that time if you didn't intend on killing him. Plus, I think John mentioned these two hit squads that came on in, make sure the job is done right, I could only assume, right, if it's such a personal job. Yeah, two and airplanes apparently flew from Saudi Arabia to Turkey in one it's day all on and flew video. back. And they didn't stop for yeah. the sights, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's all they, on video. Didn't go to Salisbury to look at the tower. This, yeah. gen, this man's gen, uh, Wasn't this gentleman's uh, fiancé waiting outside of the embassy? Yes, yes. I mean... She this had is, a cell phone, in fact. He gave, yeah. her, he gave her his cell phone. As They're saying he may have yeah. recorded this, right? On his, no, no. On his watch or something no, like left, that? No, I, mean, I heard He, he left his cell phone with her. It's like the, <clears throat> when you go to the American embassy in <clears throat> Munich, you, you leave your consulate, you leave your cell phone at, at the box at the little station before you go in. That's, so, that's standard practice. So this is extremely brazen. This is an extremely brazen well, and I think, hit. Yeah, and I think it goes to the fact that <clears throat> America has lost its place as, as a defender of human rights. I think, it's, I think it goes to the fact that especially our friends and even our so-called enemies, although you would never know that Russia's an enemy based on what Trump says, uh, they feel carte blanche right now. They feel absolutely that nothing is going to be done to them because you know they look upon Trump as another strong guy and he is not going to do anything to them when they do this. He's well, going to say it was rogue killers who walked into, the, walked into the embassy. He still hasn't said anything about the GRU guys who tried to kill the Skirples in, in London. In fact, in fact, BBC sent people, <clears throat> this is fairly funny, BBC sent people to the little villages that those two Russian agents came from and showed them their pictures, and they said, oh, yeah, I know him. Yeah, this is his name. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm not sure about that uh, incident, but going back to this one, what do you, I was actually going to say that. What do you guys think? Do you think that our enemies have, or like, what's to say, our allies, are, who may be abusive, abusive of human rights, feel emboldened this by their— This is the test. Do you this think that's what test. it is, though? Do you think that's the the winds that our allies, who may not be friends of you know of people who have you know who believe in human rights, all of a sudden now feel like they have the right to do anything because they're on Trump's good side? I think so. I think it's absolutely clear that they believe that nothing will, that they can act with impunity now. I know? think that uh, your middle America, your heartland America, are more concerned with employment. <laughs> they're more concerned with putting food on the table. They're more concerned with getting an honest wage and paying their bills. And be it fortunate or not, other people in other countries being tortured are secondary. So it's much more important that, what's happening here. So much for that beacon of freedom thong. But thing, also, huh? <laughs> this, this gentleman had an American green card. So this is some, some sort of... Uh, Attack towards Trump also well, between for his the allies. So this is so he bad. worked for the Washington Post. Yeah. I mean that that is a, U a United it's, States corporation. This is, I'm just saying it seems a bit confusing for our ally who's relying on us for military equipment to do something so brazen to somebody who has an American green card in such a sloppy fashion. Uh, 
it, something You'd doesn't add up just yet. Done, Put it that if, way. If it was done more, uh, less sloppy? Uh, well, that would, that would indicate at least it came probably more likely from the top, well, in my I, opinion. I don't think it was done sloppily. I mean, it was done brazenly. You're right on that. Very way. brazen. But it wasn't done sloppily. In fact, I think that's why they've invited the Turks to go search the compound, because they cleaned it up. You know, they got Mr. Mr. What do you call those they guys? They did that clean come it up. In? Yeah. yeah, they had the cleaners yeah. come in. Yeah. This, yeah. this yeah. is like exactly. a full movie. This yeah. is crazy. Right. The least right. they could have had was an imposter wearing his clothes <laughs> walk out on film, you know? Yeah, you would think. But yeah. still, the fact yeah. this man had a, a an American green card... Uh, it seems to be some sort of indicator that not as all good on the Trump Saudi relations either way because I don't see how they would want to do something like that. Guarantee of this is going to strain the relations. Yeah, no question is, about it. Yeah, and I guess Trump is still uh, immediately going into fixer mode trying to soothe things over, but it's hard to soothe over murders. I don't know how Trump's going to try to handle this business deal. He's going to handle the time. it behind closed doors. I mean, out and about, he's not going to say much, but when he gets him on the the red hot phone or whatever, he's going to to say, what in the F are you guys doing down there? And, and I know every president, even Obama, the Bushes, the Clintons, they have a tough job as you know, as the American president. You have to meet these people who don't live the way you live. And if they had done what you, they do in your country, they'd probably be executed for, you know, first degree murder. Uh, so and now you have to negotiate against these people in good faith and you have to abide by their culture when you negotiate with them. They teach you that in law school. Like if you're going to negotiate with the Russians, right? We talked about this. You got to learn to drink and go. That's how they close deals over there. They taught me this in a law school class. This is not like, uh, you know, s- school for scoundrels. This is real stuff. So how do they teach you how to drink, Robert? I told them I don't drink. <laughs> Yo. And, you know, they're like, well, that's a problem if you're, you're ever going to go international. Yeah. Mm. I say, I'll figure it out, right? I'll be fine. But, yeah. Nobody, there's specific nobody ten- like Trump. <laughs> well, uh, he doesn't drink either? No. He's a teetotaler. He's a teetotaler. Uh, doesn't, complete. Doesn't drink. Because his, doesn't his older drugs, brother has Oh, older yeah, brother yeah. That's a sad that's Died a of an alcohol. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 So was Hitler, by the way. So was Mitt Romney. A lot of people don't drink. I think there was a whole movement called Prohibition, <laughs> you know. But uh, but, but anyway, the jury is out. I, I mean, it's only been since October second, um, and the wags are wagging their maws. I mean, Lindsey Graham has sounded a lot of alarms. Uh, Rubio has sounded a lot of alarms. But what would you have them do? Blow and up the exactly de- what they're doing. Blow up the deal as far as no, uh, oh, as far as the arms deal. Yeah, I don't know. My jury's out too. That's a tough call, right? You it's, bet it is. Oh, my God. Because you yeah. don't want to hurt American jobs because Absolutely. you're standing up for what's right. But at the same time, you know, stopping two people from killing each other in a different country, they, I don't know how we have much jurisdiction out there It's not for this two one. people. That's the problem. If well, we were two people, we wouldn't have any jurisdiction. But this is the government, which is our ally, committing murder. Well, and, the, and, and that becomes problematic. That does the become execution problem. rate has gone up, way up since MSB. Am I getting that right? MSB. Yeah. Oh, MBS. All right. MBS. Uh, since I've, MBS has taken over, the, the rate of execution has gone up. You heard what he did in the name of fighting corruption, right? He invited all these gazillionaires to this big fancy hotel, and then he essentially welded the door shut and imprisoned them there. Rich Colton. Yeah. 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 He said, well, I'm fighting corruption. What do you guys think the best way to, to stop this out. is? They had to pay their way out. Do you know that? <laughs> I didn't know that. Oh, yeah, they had to I buy didn't know the, they got out. Oh, yeah, they, buy, they bought their way out. They had uh, to pay their way out. I see. Yeah. I was going to say, what do you think the best way to stop this is? Maybe it's not being so reliant which. on their exactly. oil, right? Well, Because we can't be the stand first up thing. to them otherwise. That would be the first thing. Yeah. yeah. We have to be energy independent because otherwise, selling weapons to countries at war that are going to be at war anyways, that's a moral decision, and you can come down either way on that. You know, who cares if they have Chinese weapons or, or Russian weapons? Or you fund so, both sides. Or like you fund United States did with Iraq and that, Iran war. Exactly. That's a vague, that's a, that's a kind of a gray area moral decision, where they're going to be committing this war anyway. It's a business decision. Exactly. Well, well, we'll talk the, about... The enemy of my enemy is my friend, Mike was just saying that's earlier. That's right. I believe that's what Ford said about the Holocaust when he continued to do business with Hitler. You know? It's, so that's it's, the other side of well, the Ford the was coin. a famous anti-Semite. Yeah, and Ford I, was a way. famous anti-Semite. Okay, but so, but that was the rationale. I mean, you know, whatever. What about IBM? Was IBM also a famous anti-Semite? They continued I don't know. To, Were they? They continued to do business with Hitler. Hitler used their stuff as part of the Holocaust. Well, that's why governments have to impose sanctions yeah. to, to regulate businesses, because businesses don't make these political decisions, or they shouldn't. Or moral ones. Correct. They're, yeah. they're, they operate on money. That's how they're... Uh, Organized. The world is a business, Mr. Bill. 
I, I would love to stick my middle finger out to OPEC. I've wanted to do that ever since the OPEC oil embargo in 1973 or so, whatever. So there we go. We got a plan right here. Yeah, right? We're, Com Central. We're going to become energy independent. Then we won't have to send our money out for the oil. And then we could stand up to the Saudis. But for now, we're pretty much beholden to them. Not as much as we were before. Yeah, it's we're, getting we're, better, right? We're yes. actually it's getting better. We're actually the largest oil producer, or about to become the largest oil producer in the world, even bigger than the Saudis. But is it? Yeah. But I believe it's the crude that we need from them, right? We have different types. So we have shale, we have gas, and we do the most of the refining here. But I still believe that the large percentage of the actual raw crude comes out of there, right? Uh, and it's a lot. Yeah, that's for damn sure. And they have billions of barrels down there. Yes, they do. So we have to get off of the oil system, except for you know things that need jet fuel. Like well, we're, we're going, we're going towards that. We're we're going towards away from fossil fuels. Didn't Kanye West the other day in the Oval Office tell President Trump about a um, a solar jet? We got to talk to Kanye West about this. You That's a joke. Folks. You mean Ye? <laughs> is that his Ye. new name? Ye. Yeah, his new name is Ye. Ye. Ye, Ye. Ye whatever. Ye. 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 Y e is his name now. You know, he heard... was talking about a solar jet. I don't know what it is. Trump and Kanye are kindred spirits, huh? <laughs> yeah. You can't. You can't make that stuff up. Yeah. My name is Steve Appel. You're listening to Work Comp Matters. We're brought to you by A1 Law Santa Monica Tickets. And ABC Rugs, we're going to take our last musical break, and we'll be back with our last story after this. One, two, three. Sinking in the sea. Oh, I got my sweet surrender. You can do no wrong with me. Holding on forever. You got to talk to me, talk to me, baby, in your secret melody. Oh, send it, send it, send it. Let it out like 
Retirement, a term made popular by economist Chris Farrell, is a phenomenon currently happening in the United States where folks are returning to the workforce after having retired from the workforce. Income is one of the reasons for this return, but boredom and the need for meaningful work are other reasons. And folks, I just saw this story and it fascinated me. Unretirement. Well, I know that there are, there's more of a influx of people that are working to a greater age so they can increase the amount of their social security uh, that they're paid. I don't know about boredom or whatnot, uh, but people are working longer, and it's becoming more difficult uh, to afford to live your lifestyle simply on social security. John, would you ever consider... Um, going back to work as a lawyer. I, first, I want to know if you're currently getting Social Security. Yes. I mean, do they prohibit that if you live in Germany or something like that? No, in fact, they, they direct mail it to my bank in Germany. Okay. <laughs> and so now, go ahead, ask Mike. Uh, I mean, answer Mike's question, yeah. Would you ever consider that, John? No. So you are retired, you're done. Well, I'm done doing that. Well, uh, what if, for example, what if, what if for example, John... Um, Somebody, let's say there was a presidential candidate that you happen to like, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And somebody that was a Santa Santa Clara law grad or a UCLA law grad uh, became attorney general. And he said, well, you know, I know this guy Scalia. Uh, Can you help me out here in D.C.? There's no Um, way John's going into politics. No, he's not in politics. He'd be mm -hmm. at the attorney general's office. There's something like that. Uh, I would think if he got offered like maybe a weekly radio show that paid him (laughs) like in Germany, he he wouldn't blink an eye. He'd be there. But John, you know what I'm talking about. I mean, something like that. I mean, would Uh, you? I mean, it would be I would probably think about it. Yeah. I mean, as I said, my my best friend in California is Governor Brown's right hand man, and so far he's never offered me a, a position. He's not, a, you're not he, talking about Gavin Newsom. No, I'm talking about Jerry's right hand guy. Well, that's the Lieutenant General. No, no, I mean Jerry's right hand advisor. Okay, okay. His yeah. name is actually Dan Crane. He's, Go ahead. he's been Go my ahead. my friend forever. Uh, so Dan's never offered me a job. He's Lieutenant offered me, Governor, not Lieutenant General. Lieutenant right. Governor. He's Go, offered. Go he's you know he's offered me to do stuff and you know, various various projects, but. But and we talk all the time, but uh, it would depend. I mean, you know, I used to joke. I'd said the only job I would go in public in public for would be to be press secretary, because it, the job description is simple: you drink with the press and you lie to the press, and I can I can do that. <laughs> but there would be there could be a scenario where you would uh, jump back in the race. Extremely unlikely. I see. As they always say, never say never. But How about ten years unlikely. ago, or let's say eight years ago? Would the scenario be more likely? Or? No, not really. I see. Not really. I just finished writing my autobiography, by the way. So it, it's about 330 pages long. So it's not like I haven't been doing anything. Right. <laughs> so you haven't been bored. Can't wait for the no. movie. <laughs> Running marathons. And all. Now, no, no. now, now here, here's the follow-up question. Yeah. Robert, are you starting yet to plan for retirement? Or is that just way too far away? Uh, maybe next week, two weeks from now, I'll be done. <laughs> right? I'm ho- oh, one can hope, but uh, Have otherwise... You closed on your house. I, I was going to uh, say, settle that $10 million case, and that, that'll help, right? Well, one of you guys, you know, give me the referral. <laughs> okay? Something happens, give me a call, and then and then we'll all retire, I guess. Or definitely me, at least. Not uh, not me. I'm, I'm not fully retired for another seven to ten years. But to be honest, fully I don't retired. think I'm going to ever retire. So that's a different story. i got to tell yeah. you, I plan on never retiring yeah ever yeah why and, what else are you gonna do god am i stuck with you for that long <laughs> there you go <laughs> what else would you do i mean i guess you could travel but that's like time off of work for traveling that makes sense i don't really want to travel yeah but i mean even after traveling you, a lot of times you just want to go back to your own bed 
a lot of times. You know, the first yes. thing you do after you get off of As the plane. As I get older. I was going to say, I travel from Woodland Hills to Van Nuys and back. Yeah, it's know? unfortunate that we, you know, in the best seat for every sporting event and you're probably in your living room, <laughs> right? Right, right. It's, it's tough. And I know, I know. You want your own shower and your own bed and you want to you want to be done. First thing you do is you like pop into your own bed when you get home and then you get back up. Uh, so people like that. You know, it's comfort. But uh, work is fun as far as I'm concerned. You know, I like helping people with my job you know, helping the injured worker. And if you find uh, fulfillment in your job, I don't see why you would ever necessarily have to stop. I mean, just as long as I'm capable. There so. you go. Yeah. Well, and, and I'll be the judge of that. Thank <laughs> you very much. John, how long are you uh, in beautiful Southern California for? I'm leaving Saturday. All right. Back to, back to non-sunny Munich because the weather is turning and soon it will be ski season. And can we continue to uh, expect your uh, five-minute uh, weekly reports? Absolutely. Oh, that's great. I, I make really a concerted effort to adhere to the timeline. And, and I really, really appreciate that. If there's any way that your sleep schedule gets altered <laughs> and you want to come on live from the phone, we'll do that. But for now, I, I think right now, I mean, we, we record right now, it's about... Uh, six thirty, and which is about like four thirty in the morning or something Nine like that. Nine hours ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Uh, well, it, once again, it's it's been a fantastic show, and uh, I got to thank uh, my chief of staff, Doctor Mike Zima, who keeps me uh, out of trouble and in check about ninety percent of the time. Um, Forty-five year plus attorney John Scalia graced us with his presence from six thousand miles away. It's wonderful to have you here. Thank you. And please enjoyable. come back soon, uh, my protege, uh, Attorney Robert Ozeron. Yes, I discovered him, but no, he is responsible for himself. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you say that after you have to distance yourself for a right. few of my comments. That's exactly. fine. Exactly. I'll take it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, on the board for Uncle Studio, Scott Walton, taking care of all of the technical difficulties. And of course, uh, we couldn't do the show uh, without all of the good people uh, who continue to support and approve of this project back at WorkComp Central, including but not limited to Mr. Lee File and Mr. Jake Paris. My name is Steve Appel. We'll see you again next week for another edition of WorkComp Matters. Matters.